first and foremost, can we move away from what you are talking about, the subsistence farming? In my opinion, no. Not, not, not immediately. Okay. And I'll explain why, and I'll now explain why, how we can. Okay. Okay. Why our land tenure system? You know, people kill for land, and that's mm. a small piece of land. Mm. So land in, in Nigeria and Africa is not something you go and joke with, with somebody. Mm. It's not a joking matter. It's not, it's someone's life you are talking about. It's someone's, <laughs> someone's life that you are talking about. So mm. our land tenure system and our cultural heritage has made is, is going to make that very difficult if okay. even possible all right um so so that's the first thing um land has been passed down from generation to generation and even me as civilized as i am in in abuja i still hold on to the the My life that that in in your your village. Village. <laughs> 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 If you just joined us, this is The Conversation, reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. Now, let's go straight to our conversation for today. But before we begin, we'll start by taking our quote. And the first one is from an anonymous who once said, Further down the supply chain, food manufacturers have, um, have been facing higher prices across a variety of important inputs ranging from agricultural commodities and food ingredients to packaging, energy, and transportation. Okay, now I'll take my next quote, and this one is from um, Thomas Jefferson, who is an American statesman, diplomat, lawyer, architect, philosopher, and founding father who served as the third president of the United States from 1801 to 1809. He once said, Agriculture is our wisest pursuit because it will, in the end, contribute the most to real wealth, good morals, and happiness. Okay, I'll take my third one, and this is from Will Rogers, American um, performer, actor, and humorous um, social commentator, who once said, the farmer has to be an optimist or he wouldn't be or still be a farmer. I wonder what that means. <laughs> okay, so then my last one will be from um, M.S. Swamanathan, who was an Indian agronomist, agriculture, um, agricultural scientist, plant um, genesist, administrator, and hum um, humanitarian. He once said, um, if agriculture goes wrong, nothing else will have the chance to go right. Absolutely spot on. Now let's see how this quote relates to what we'll be discussing today. Very warm greetings and welcome to D Conversation, reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. I am Annabel Oji. Today, we'll turn our attention to the agricultural sector. That's Nigeria's agricultural sectors. We're looking at 2023 in retrospect. And our focus, like I said, will be on the agricultural sector as we're looking at um, food inflation, and how much it has affected not only um, the farmers but also the end users and my guest on the show today is Udeme Joseph Daniel who is um, a farmer he's also the CEO of Farm Monitor Africa it is great to have you on the show Daniel thank you Annabelle thank you for having me great great to have you okay now so let's start by looking at um Nigeria's agricultural sector, which was been looking at all through 2023. Now, when we started um, this year, we got the um, information from NIMED saying that the flood this year will be far worse yeah. than what we saw last year. Yeah. And then everyone, I'm sure the farmers, you guys were like agitated at the edge, like, okay, let's get ready for the worst. Mm -hmm. But it looks like it's not happening the way that um, they predicted. Yes. Is that good for your business or not yes yes very good for for business okay and however we say had spates of floods um interestingly the nigerian system has a very exciting um climate situation mm. sometimes it floods sometimes it's drought mm. so you are wondering which one you are dealing with exactly at every material time and mm. um, this just goes for that to emphasize the need for us to be serious about climate action okay. and taking concrete steps to address climate issues. Uh, I know that some of us don't even think about these kinds of things because, I mean, we have a lot of issues to worry about, but um, the climate issue has been real. We've experienced it on the farm. And if you're not a farmer, you really won't understand. 
But if you are a farmer and you go to the farm today, it's flood that has washed away everything you planted. Mm -hmm. And then next week it is that there is no rain at all for the thing you planted to grow. Then you know that that raises a lot of concern mm -hmm. for you. Thank God for the um, conference, the program going on in UAE now. Mm -hmm. um, I believe a lot of um, actions will be taken. We hope that after all of the conversations um, in UAE, a lot of actions will, will follow through. Mm -hmm. So how much did um, last year's flood affect your business? Uh, let's see, personally, you. Okay, so last year, I wasn't really affected by flood because last year, we were already aware of the challenge to come. Oh, really? Yes, and um, part of the things that um, my organization does is um, monitoring farms, and we use weather analytics to take data-driven information. So we already saw that coming. Ah, and okay. we told those that um, use our system um, that you don't just just skip this we skipped we we dodged the bullets ah. and that's because we had insights but it was very catastrophic and you know it wasn't just the flooding from rains it was also the flooding from the dams mm. around us that mm. were broken so it was it was at a catastrophic level mm. it was so um but this year has been relatively better even though we've had a lot of other shocks political mm. shocks for instance so the change in administration has meant that um, a lot of um, financing has been on suspension and you can understand that i mean a new administration can't come and just start spending money he needs to take stock mm. so um, this entire um, rainy season and um, there was not as much productivity as the usually is mm. because um, government didn't finance as they usually would but they've picked up again in the dry season but, but how does government financing affect or impact your business okay maybe so, you personally okay so, so me personally no, not not really me okay but when you look at this piece generally um a lot of our farmers are smallholder farmers they are dependent on all of the um, support in terms of mm. inputs and um, seeds fertilizers and all of those kinds of things okay and if you don't give them that much um they won't be able to do so much and and the typical reason is that if you look at their what we call the eop the economics of production all right so um, right now it takes about four hundred thousand to pl plant a hectare of rice if the hectare of rice yields and our national average yield is two if i'm even up to two ton but let's say two ton per per hectare okay so let me break that down the way you're looking at it i'm looking for trouble okay, so, so what that simply means is that a hectare of rice is supposed to give us four bags of paddy rice so paddy rice is the unprocessed rice okay. that's the rice with the back yeah okay at least 40 bags so okay. 40 bags of 100 kg is four ton oh, okay. is four thousand tons so it's a different kg you measure when um it's with the back and it's not with the back yeah yes yes the back also has um has a lot of things it's not only the back alone now there are other impurities and all of that okay yeah. so before you get to eat your rice mm. there's a lot of there's so much that mm. goes from the stoning the, 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 the sorting and all of that so but at the point at the farm level mm. which is where our concern is Averagely, a hectare of um, farm is supposed to give you 40 bags of 100 kg rice. Okay. Okay. But in Nigeria, that same rice gives us l lower than 20 bags. Ah. So that is why I said, so national average is two ton. Okay. But the potential of the seed itself is four ton. Mm. But we are not even doing up to half. So there, there are too many things wrong with why we are not doing so well so because we are not hitting our year potential the average farmer doesn't really have a turnover in terms of profits oh really yes and we thought that they are the ones that are always gulping all the so, money in fact if you do the calculation and you 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 look at it analytically mm. if they make for instance 1.5 ton if you multiply that by the cost of the paddy rice in the market you see that they are not hitting even break even oh so that's why government always subsidizes hmm. and and that's why government can't even talk tax with farmers because we are not even doing so much for our for even our own selves hmm. so the way out is for farmers to actually begin to improve their yield how do they do that uh, there, there are lots of that's that that will take this intercommission but one of the ways is um using farm monitor for instance so so let, let me throw that in here <laughs> All right. yeah, okay. because that's what farm monitor actually does it helps farmers improve their yield by making recommendations to them like i told i didn't farm last day because i knew that it was going to rain because part of what makes part of what comes into our system that you know makes the uh, part of what runs our algorithm mm. is um is, is climate mm. is, is the weather okay so um, there are many things um improved seedlings um having good technology having um, um good seats having 
at least knowing what to do when to do it, we call it gap good agronomic practice. Those okay. are some of the several things that can make them yield. But because, like I said, our situation is such that we, the average farmer is not very informed. Mm. So part of what is making him not yield is that he is not informed. He still does things the way he saw his father mm. do it. Mm or his grandfather in some cases, mm. and things have changed. Mm. So let me make it very practical for you. So imagine that um, my great-grandfather farmed on this plot of land. Mm. My grandfather came and farmed on this same plot of land. My father has farmed on this same plot of land, and me, I am farming on this same plot of land. This land cannot, can never yield the way it yielded for my grandfather. Okay. Because between them and us, we've mined the entire minerals and nutrients that mix the crop grow well. But then we, used to, uh, we grew up with that thought that um, land never depreciates. Ex and, that, and that for me is what is killing us the most. And, and, and this is the conversation we should have in Nigeria now. Because it's not every land that is arable that is farmable. So this ah. is, and that's what I just explained. Mm. So what is called arable land is the land that you can farm on potentially. Mm. And we have a lot of that in Nigeria. I think over 34,000 and 34 million hectares or so, but quite a lot. I'm not sure of the statistics now. However, of all of this land that we have, because we've been mining nutrients from it mm. without ever replenishing it. In fact, some of us don't even do shifting cultivation. A lot of the other strategies that you can use to replenish nutrients in the soil, we don't do it. We just keep farming because of that mindset. Oh. So the land is depreciating. So if you give me a loan, for instance, to farm this piece of land, thinking I'm going to get the crop I should get, mm. if you don't know the history of this land, this land could quite literally make me not even yield one ton. Are you for real? You so you have to even check history of the land it's before you start. That is it. That's why I said this is the conversation we should be having now. Mm. Because you see, like our politicians cannot do things that will replenish the land because nobody sees it. It's intangible. Mm. If your senator came and said I invested 200 million in replenishing land, you say he eats the money. Because you can't say, but if you say you use 200 million to build a bridge, because I've seen the bridge, you say you need But mm. the truth is, for sustainability, okay. the conversations we should be having now should be about restoring the soil, restoring the land for sustainability. Because mm. the mistakes we are making today, the choppings we are chopping today, is going to affect our children in the future. The oh, choppings okay. our parents chopped. Is affecting, is affecting us. Ah, so that that um, uh, mindset is just uh, no, no, it's a very unrelated yes mindset. Yes. Ah, right. okay. So when when you are in the space, one of the things you 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 get to find out really quick is that if you keep planting on a particular land, the yield keeps decreasing. Oh wow! And that's something also we do in farm monitor. We're trying to help keep track records of you know of lands that have been farmed. So that over time you will know your level of productivity so that if you are giving somebody a loan you are financing there's a lot of financing going on mm. the central bank finances mm. and the government generally finances they, they need to know this place i'm financing i can't we can't yield more than this because it's been it's been used so this actually, so how do you know well, there are very many ways to know the primary way is soil testing okay and i'm aware that the ministry of agric um, the lands department of the Ministry of Agri have done soil analysis in eight states. Mm. As of yesterday, I had a conversation with them, and I know that last year they did four. This year they've done four. Okay. Uh -huh. So, um, and, and one of the people driving that project is um, Doctor, um, what's his name now? Um, I, I know, I know, I know him. I, I mean, I've met him, Doctor Deboye. Okay. You know, um, in Ministry of Federal Ministry of Agri. Um, 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 Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security. I know that they've driven a process to actually check the most fertile areas in Nigeria, segment by segment. Mm. Segment by segment. I know that that's something Ministry of Agriculture is currently doing. But like I said, because of financing, who really wants to finance that? If I didn't tell you now, you wouldn't know. Nobody on the street knows what has been done. Mm. And because it's a ministry, nobody's really saying, okay, this is what we are doing. So we are here thinking the ministry is not doing so much. But yeah, but they are, they are doing some very quiet things. And for those of us that are players, um, instead of going to foreign places to look for this kind of information, we just 
approach the ministry and they can really help. Okay, um, so you've actually said quite a number of things that we're going to draw out from before we yeah, yeah. land or finish this um, current conversation. But now let's talk about the agricultural sector, Nigeria's agricultural sector, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. since 2020, all through 2023. Okay. How far so far? Would you actually say that um, are we making progress or has it been retrogression? How would you... Um, okay, if, if you ask to rate the Nigeria's agricultural sector from a scale of uh, 1 to 10, 1 being the highest and 10 being the lowest, what would be your scale? You know why, you know why I'm smiling? I always do this to my staff. <laughs> Don't give me an answer if you're not going to put it on a scale of 1 to 10. So ah. I know exactly what I'm doing with. <laughs> you know, I did that just last night. I had that information. I could come on a scale of 1 to 10. What is it? He said 10. And I'm okay, so this is an yeah, emergency. Go <laughs> this is an emergency. Okay, okay so it, it will depend on what indices you want to judge Nigeria doing well or not doing well by. Some indices we've done well. Some indices we haven't done well. That's why I said, but the general indices when it comes to agriculture is productivity. Mm. How productive have we been? We've been generally low. On a scale of 1 to 10, 50-50. We would have done better but like i said i think largely because of the funding issue okay because 70 percent of our farmers are dependent on that funding issue mm. you, you know a, a, a lot of our smallholder farmers are looking for money from government to be able to do something so if that money doesn't come it becomes um, a challenge so i think last year was would, would be one of our poorest oh wow yes yeah, statistically oh, and wow. you can quote me anyway Mm. last year would be or this year this year, rather. this year would be one of our poorest despite the flood from last year yes yeah, so the flood from last year at least we could understand it was the flood that so you could say that this was what made us mm. well, and because the flood is not an every year affair mm. like i said the, the flood last year was principally occasioned by the dam and, the, and mm. all of that so yes the rains had its own, its own impact but the dams contrib contributed much more mm. much more you know so and we had information and the information about the dam was given early enough so it's not like we didn't know but this year has been largely because we've not done as much work as we usually do mm. across board I, I mean i know people that um, um and for instance second seconds farms has um 2300 hectares I, I don't think he did more than 200 hectares this year in that whole large land because money mm. Mm. so the financial thing okay. has really really been the real reason why we haven't been productive Mm. Well, of okay. course, outside security, hate men and all of that, which it's its, its own problem. And okay, so now if you talk about security, then how much, um, let's say for you, who is a private player, mm. how much has it has actually affected you? Because you've heard of um, um, farmers talk about how they have to pay bandits before they um, release their product to the market. And all of that um, um, cost mm. is shifted down to the end user. So I've heard that too. I've not experienced it. Okay. So I, I probably have very little information on that, but I've read it in the papers, like I'm sure you've read it too, that this is what is happening in, in, in the north, is it not west, mm. there about or not east. So we, we've heard about that, but I haven't experienced that. The, the closest shave I've had with, with um, this challenge has been in my farm in Niger State. I have farms in 30 different states. But in Niger State, we had a situation where the castle, um, the, the, well, headsmen, because they are wearing, cows and um, came into our field ate up some of the things we had planted even damaged some of our irrigation system in the place and mm. we had a conversation with their with their head in that community is a banasara community in um, it's close to Bida, but the 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 that that village itself is not in Bida, but it's really just close to Bida because we stay in Bida when we are farming okay you know and we had a conversation with with them incidentally for me my private my personal experience was they were quite in fact they apologized and that was because of our the relationship headsmen. yes they did they are the head of that system okay they did apologize to us well for me it was particularly because we had been very fair and kind to the women so brings the brings up the issue of csr community relations all right so in our dealings in that community we have been fair with them Okay. We've been very fair with them. So even the women that come to glean, we still give them money. And I didn't even know that this way they are wives or something. But it was actually that conversation that, you know, my manager was saying to them, but don't your wives tell you that this farm, this man is the one that... I you know comes. that those little things that you do, and they frankly help me. I frankly didn't know. Mm. So in fact, it was at that point that they now said, ah, is he the person? And they now started apologizing. So... Now, the huge lesson I learned from this, whether we accept it or not, we need CSRs. We need to educate people. Mm. We need to show much more love. I think it's going to take a lot of love, but 
I, I, I don't see any way out of this. Ah, mm. okay. Okay, so now I hear you um, talk about how our um, fathers, grandfathers, or mm. forefathers used to farm. And then I remember you, we, we keep talking about um, how we need to move, since the world is going green, yes. how we need to move away from um, persistent or subsistence um, farming, farming yes. and then move to um, technology, that we mechanized. Yes. Um, so at what point are we actually going to get there? Two questions I'm going to ask, and I'd like you to embody them in one breath. Now, that's one on the side. And then secondly, if you look at the fact, we've always heard um, how much we only farm just to consume. Mm. We're not a producing country. We've heard that like so many times. So how are we going to, especially for that local farmer who is in the village, who they, are, um, they, they have to farm um, tomatoes, beans, or whatever, it, uh, uh, it actually affects us. How would they um, leave that they are using the track, uh, the track, the uh, holes and the mm. machetes and the uh, digging, and they move to the mechanized farming. Okay, so like every other thing that grows, it has to be systemic. It has to be done intentionally. Okay. And I've already said that we really need a lot of education for our farmers. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and take this slowly so that you you get my thoughts on it. Okay. So. First and foremost, can we move away from what you are talking about, the subsistent farming? In my opinion, no. Not, not, not immediately. Okay. And I'll explain why, and I'll now explain why, how we can. Okay. Okay. Why our land tenure system? You know, people kill for land, and just mm. a small piece of land. Mm. So land in, in Nigeria and Africa is not something you go and joke with, with somebody. Mm. It's not a joking matter. It's not it's someone's life you are talking It's someone's, <laughs> someone's life that you are talking about. Mm. So our land tenure system and our cultural heritage has made, is, is going to make that very difficult, if okay. even possible. All right? Um, so, so that's the first thing. Um, land has been passed down from generation to generation. And even me as civilized as I am in, in Abuja, I see hold on to the, the land like that the I have been in. Like, don't joke with you. No, 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 no. But, and, and, and in all sincerity, even when we had a little challenge mm. at home, about land at home, I, I told my mom, it's easy to trivialize this land because it's in the village and probably not worth up to one million, even though it's a huge, maybe a, more than a hectare of land. Mm. It's easy to trivialize it. However, two things should make us not trivialize it. Number one, we don't know what it costs these people to leave this land for us. We don't know what it costs them. It may look trivial to us, but this is someone's life and what he felt as a cried to leave as an inheritance. And it's a serious language when you say the word inheritance. Mm. All right, so that's on one breath. On the second breath, if oil was to be found on that land, mm. this is not the same attitude you will be having. You understand? So it's easy to trivialize it now. So I, that, but I told her so. But what, what is that the, de uh, the detriment of your own life? Because I hear people say that, oh, please, just don't, don't make it look like I'm a chicken. <laughs> chicken has <laughs> better be alive. Yeah, I agree. But like I said, it, it's okay to say chicken out and be alive. But like I said again, if you if oil was discovered on that piece of land, with trillions of naira <laughs> potential, <laughs> sister. Even me, I'm not sure how. how <laughs> I'm not sure how. So, so the point is very simple. So, our cultural heritage, land as an inheritance, you understand, and the way we hold it so dear, mm. um, and, and all of that, it's going to make it really tough. Okay. That's on one breath, and then oh, well, the, the second breath, like I said. Now, so the thirdly, because quite clearly these people live on that land. Mm. Live not just living on it, but the food they eat is from that land. Mm. So it's kind of difficult for you to really change the... the it, it's going to take a lot of political will mm. to change our land use act. It's going to take a lot of political will. That the person is going to be ready to lose his second term. Mm. Which you know our politicians, none of them is ready to do. Mm. Right? To be able to say, okay, see this, we need to find a way and innovative way to think about how to manage our land system all right so of course land generally belongs to government but because it's been passed down from generation to generation, but mm. generally we need to rethink our, our system around that now because of that a person that has been farming a piece of land knows that piece of land mm. he is not farming that piece of land as business he's farming that piece of land as one culture mm. two a source of food and even that number one is enough reason 
for him to you know we in nigeria we can die for our culture and our tribe and our religion religion but mm. we will not anything that is when you are telling somebody this thing that you see this land that you want to die for doesn't make any sense he will even kill you for saying that <laughs> you know it's, it's really sad that mm. we, we haven't been able to so it still boils down to education we need to find a way to educate our people down there which now brings me to the interface between what you are talking about and how we can achieve it okay it's education but how it's not just formal education because formal education won't just cut like that mm. it has to be a cultural level education the best set of people that do this are extension agents extension agents are farming agents that you know are supposed to take information research technology education down to the farmers so they are the interface between the people that are making the research and are changing things and doing the technology and then the farmers okay. the farmers don't have all of this information that we are having mm. and that's because that linkage that bridge in nigeria is almost non-existent almost quite almost non-existent okay now so if you are going to make that leap of change it's going to be that's why i say it's going to be done tactically okay. we've got to start from where we now go back to our extension agents and say okay let's build the extension system mm. currently our extension system has one extension agent to like seven thousand farmers oh wow the ideal situation is one extension agent to 250 farmers mm. So we have all of these many farmers. So you know that 70% of um, um, Nigeria, in Nigeria, if you look at the farming system, 100%, 70% are smallholder farmers. Mm. So they actually need this extension to be able to do better, which is part of what they need to do better, mm. outside the other several things I mentioned. Okay. Now, that bridge is not there. Who is telling the farmer in the village, this seed that you planted and you kept in your house, you shouldn't use it again this year? Mm. because it will not be as productive as if you actually go and buy seed that has been designed or was planted or has been you know there's how they prepare seed mm. for planting nobody the man just harvests this year keeps part of it for next year and he's fine with it okay so so they have the burden but then you talked about the extension agents mm. how about um the traditional leaders are they supposed to be in this round table because a lot of people farmers will tell you that you cannot know this business more than i do because i inherited it from my father so you cannot know it better than i do mm. so how about um also bringing the traditional leaders the tr and the religious leaders into this um fall to also talk to them but they've, always, work? They've, they've always been there now it's not like they've not been there but you see like i said those guys at that level are not their challenge is not how to educate the farmers. They have lots of other things they are involved with. Mm. However, there is somebody that is supposed to be responsible, which is the extension agent. Does the extension agent need to liaise with the cultural and traditional leaders? Absolutely. You can't just walk into a community. In fact, usually the extension agents are from that same community. Yeah, okay, okay. Because you need to be able to speak the local language. You need mm. to know whose farm is this. You need to be able to have a lot of information mm. that is local to that area. So it's a localized service. But you know, the, the urban migration has made everybody wants to come to town mm. to do white collar job. Nobody wants to go. But this is what I, I have always proposed. We want the extension system. We have lots of universities of um, University of Agriculture in Nigeria. Mm. I think about six major ones. Umudike, in Funap, there is um, in Zaria, in ABU. I mean about six there about really solid universities of agri. The people that are graduating from there you have to make extension work appealing to them and my opinion is pay them well pay them let's say eighty thousand okay. at least in today's economy mm. at least eighty thousand fifty thousand will be performance based thirty thousand will be productivity based this is what i mean fifty thousand if they go to the field and do the work which you will be monitoring we have a system that can monitor that so can quite literally track the extension agent mm. where you are giving data from where you are recording things from so if they if they're supposed to go to the field two times a week which is like eight times eight to ten times in a month pay them fifty thousand so every time they go to the field they are they are they are part they are um tablets mm. that they've been to work so that money has been credited to them after the end of the month they have that their money paid then the other thirty percent the other thirty thousand will be productivity based meaning that they can only unlock it if they help the farmer meet the yield potential for that year oh okay great okay and then kit them. Mm. 
give them all they need. They need bikes. It's village, it's village terrain. Mm. And, you know, like I said, this, you have to go around, sometimes you have to go around the village. Mm. They need bike. You need to give them bike, give them food, give them tablets, give them PPEs. Because one of the things that kill farmers is snake. I've lost a farmer to snake bites. Mm. So give them properly. Make it appealing. Do you know, actually, well, this thing they call, uh, if you're a layman, you're a layman, you don't know anything at, at all about a particular thing. I, I just realized it's true, because I didn't know there's anything called extension agents. I never, Are you serious? I never heard about it before. You just know uh, farmers. So, so that is, in fact, do you know that, in my opinion, and uh, I can defend this my opinion, I think that until we make the extension service delivery the backbone of our national productivity, nothing will change. You see all of this. You see all of these inputs we are giving. We are giving it through private companies who want to make profits. Have because again, giving the input is one thing. Mm. Using the input is another thing, mm. which now becomes the job of the extension agent. My opinion: the extension agent should be responsible from the farmer even receiving that input okay. to using that input to his productivity. Somebody has to help the farmer and be responsible. Now, if you give a private company, and a private company, so I'm speaking mm -hmm. against myself, we are just going to go and give the input. And even sometimes we are giving less the input and saying, doubling the figure and saying, we gave 20 bucks when we gave only two. Mm, okay. So, in, in, and, and because we gave only two, you are imagining that the national productivity will go high because in your head, it's 20 that was given. But it wasn't two. So, there, there's so much disjoint. There's so much gap mm. for, for sharp practice in between that i believe that you have to make somebody responsible See, so this this extension agent you also need them for um, um animal husbandry and all okay so yes so they they they, they have their own it's still extension agent that provides a kind of cover for them yes okay mm. so it's not just it's not, it's not just just cropping alone okay all right clearly there's more that we need to unbundle from this conversation with udeme joseph and we will definitely get right into it after this time out join us again The other thing is that we have a culture. I'm on TV. Actually, I'm not sure I should use this language, but it's possibly to say it in the lightest term. It's a wickedness culture. Things go up in Nigeria and never come down. Even when, even when all the elements Talk show about that it. they should come down. So mm. I, I think we have a culture of mm. thinking that when it goes up, it can never Just come down. There. You know, so, um, so that's the other reason. And that's the other thing we need to do. I don't know how we are going to change this culture. I frankly don't have a solution, all right, to that one. But I think it's something that probably the National um, Orientation Agency will mm. want to take up as a project to say, come, we need to dissuade people that, you see, why is uh, the price of um, um, a ticket 200,000 now? Uh -huh. They'll say it's dollar. Mm. But even if that dollar was, was to go to 500, to one name, um, 500 naira to one dollar now. See that ticket? It stays there. one though. Welcome back. If you just joined us, this is The Conversation. We're reaching you from Cap France Television Studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. If you just joined us, you've actually missed out on a whole lot, but then you can still join in the conversation as my guest on the show today is Daniel Udeme Joseph, who is a farmer. He's CEO of... Um, Farm Monitor Africa. Farm Monitor Africa. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, before we went on that break, we've actually touched on a, quite a number of um, salient yeah. points. But yeah. now, let's talk about Nigeria's current inflation sitting at 27.33%. Mm. And then the food inflation sitting at 31.55%. Mm. That is far more than what we've ever seen yeah. in um, recent years. In fact, ever since. So... If we're looking at the inflation, how much has, um, and we hear that food inflation, it's with regards to um, the, the high cost of um, items, the farmers mm. are also complaining. Mm. Now, if I go to the market and I'm able to, I'm not able to buy, is, the first thing, rush is not here yet, yeah. but yet um, one, just one chicken, you, can, you can't even buy one chicken for 5,000, <laughs> and then you want to buy a basket of tomato, that's another kettle of fish and time. Mm. You want to buy a bag of rice, even one middle of rice yeah. is far more than 1,200 as it used to be. So... What gives the major self? Okay, so um, we, we first need to understand that the inflation thing is not just a Nigerian thing alone. The entire world is having a spate of inflation. Mm. And that's stemmed from a lot of things, particularly the Ukraine war. Okay. All right? That has had its own impact on 
food prices, oil, and all of that. And part of what is used for fertilizer is imported from Ukraine. Part of one of those chemicals is imported from Ukraine. The dollar, too, has gone up. Mm. The, the exchange rate has gone up. Um, all of these things have their own um, impact, so to speak. So does the dollar increase in the dollar, um, uh, Naira to dollar, mm. or the uh, precipitous decline, prices, yes. does it also affect the smallholder farmers? Absolutely. Absolutely. And like I told you, a lot of those things that the smallholder farmers are using to be productive mm. are given to the, for instance, the fertilizer we just talked about. Okay. And the fertilizer is a huge deal. Huge deal because that's what we are temporarily trying to redeem the soil with to even make it productive, mm. which is not even sustainable, which is another conversation, sustainability of our food system. It's another conversation. So if you now look at it technically, it's not just fertilizer. There are several other things that the farmers are using that even the equipment itself, mm. all right, most of them are important mm. and it's affected by dollar. Mm. All right, so when you look at, okay, um, um, diesel, for instance, um, diesel used to be 200, 300 naira, went up to 800 naira. Diesel powers a lot of the machineries used in the farm so even if the, the smallholder farmer is not using the very big machines he's mm. using semi small level machines that are still powered by diesel okay so i've already said like three or four factors now so a, a combination of all of these factors is what is responsible so it will that be, they have a good reason when they tell you when you tell you yeah, yeah so it will, it, will, it, will, it will be very naive to think that it's only one thing you can point out to one i'm not an economist all right. Um, so when it comes to issues of inflation, the real details will come from maybe somebody working in the bank, um, the, maybe central bank that can give you what's really going on. But from my perspective as a farmer, and from all I know, and I know quite a bit when it comes to how these things affect us, um, these are some of the several reasons. Mm. So, and like you, uh, like I said, it's not all of these reasons that have a control room in Asso Rock. Mm. Asso Rock can control the war in Ukraine. Mm. So, so you see, so there is also little the government can do with regards to some of these things. They can only try to buffer. So I'll give you an example of what they are trying to do. We used to import a lot of wheat. And okay. that comes from all of that. In fact, wheat is our highest import into the country. Over $2 billion. Not mm. Naira. That's a huge money. Mm. But with the agro pockets and the SAPZ projects on board, now the country is trying to now massively, you know, produce wheat. So... Um, there's some financing that has gone through the agro pocket project to the smallholder farmers. So it's even the, like I say, it's even the dry season now that money is beginning to get, you know, imputes. So they are now giving imputes to farmers. All of these things are what farmers need to produce. Okay. So um, with these kinds of efforts, I think things will start coming down just gradually. The other thing is that we have a culture. I'm on TV, so I'm not sure I should use this language, but it's possibly to say it in the lightest term it's a wickedness culture things go up in nigeria and never come down even when, even when all the elements Talk show about that it. they should come down so mm. I, I think we have a culture of mm. thinking that when it goes up, it can never Just come down there. you know so and so that's the other reason and that's the other thing we need to do i don't know how we are going to change this culture i frankly don't have a solution all right to that one but i think it's something that probably the national um, orientation agency would mm. want to take up as a project to say come we need to dissuade people that you see why is uh, the price of um um a ticket two hundred thousand now uh -huh. they'll say it's dollar mm. but even if that dollar was was to go to five hundred to one um, five hundred naira to one dollar now see that ticket it's still it there. Gone, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's, that that's the particular argument i had um i saw on social media someone sent to our social media um uh, handle i said i was going to ask but thank god you actually brought it up and then i'm going to remember to ask it again um talk when you talked about wheat so, but somebody wheat, said yes. that um the kind of wheat that we produce in nigeria mm. or we farm in nigeria that is is not consumable that's the reason why we um import a lot of them but then, then i was telling the person that okay what of those ones that we used to buy from the market that we give to our parents who cannot eat um uh, flour or who mm. cannot eat cassava mm. but then we give are they saying that those ones are harmful okay so again that that one falls within the preview of um food and nutritious nutrition people i don't know why one would say that but um i don't know the science behind it because i'm a scientist by training so i think i would like to know the science behind that kind of statement but 
if we make that kind of generalized statement, then we are going to have to say that things like me is too, there's something wrong with it. Mm, because yeah. they, are, they are farmed almost in the same breath. Yeah. You know, and the same thing with rice. Mm. So, um, again, it's something the national um, so education agency will want to look at because, again, we have a way of spewing information that is not accurate. Mm. And like I said, I, even now, I can't even make a statement to it because. I'm not, I don't understand the science behind why would somebody say that. You mm. know, so we need to also help ourselves by speaking less about what we don't know about. Mm. Mm. Okay, so now let's talk about, uh, because you talked about the government. So mm. how best can you advise the, um, say, the Minister of Agriculture mm. uh, with regards to how we can um, push our agricultural sector, even looking forward to 2024? What are the... Um, the gray areas that we mm. need to look at what are the opportunities or the okay. strengths yeah. that we need to look mm. at that's one on the side two mm. questions and i'd like you to take them together the second is looking at afc fta that's the after yeah, um, that's recommendations yes, yes, yes. and then how can we actually um scale up so that we're not only doing the local but we're doing local and they're still going global because the person who is uh, who goes into say for instance chi butter mm. how can they actually scale up their product so that we can meet that after recommendations we're not lacking behind from other african countries okay so um I, I don't know which one i should start with i feel like starting with this second one okay yeah so l let me just speak about that briefly um it is called international competition Mm. you've got if everybody is competing to sell their products you must produce products that meet the international requirements mm. which is not something that we are doing in nigeria so like i said because a lot of our farming is at the subsistence level and um, there is so much to be done to tell to meet a certain standard so mm. sometimes um, we, we, that is even the reason why we can't export outside the fact that we need the food to eat mm -hmm. inside the country and so um to meet those international criteria they are things you must do from the farm level for instance using organic manure excuse me because if what you want to export has a certain level of threshold limit of certain chemicals you can't export them okay we are largely reliant on fertilizers mm. so it still boils down to that combination i say we need to start having sustainable food systems. Mm. How are we replenishing our soils? For now, it's fertilizer and it's not sustainable. Uh. This fertilizer, just think about it. When last did you see F1? Think mm. about it. When last did you see F1? So let's leave the fact that you're in Abuja. Come, you at least work on the floor. Mm. So when last did you see those, see those things that erase the soil those organisms that erase the soil you know because we can sit down here and say okay i'm in abuja i won't see but i stay in the farm okay i probably try to live in the farm in fact, for months sometimes hmm. you, you won't find those things so, so what's been seriously degraded so why do we have to look for them what importance okay. are they because ah, ah, in my mind i'm like why do i want to see everyone <laughs> ah, that that is so those are organisms that make break down all the things like the leaves and all of that and gives you quite natural um, um nutrients release natural nutrient in the soil oh. see it is the lack of this natural nutrient that is making us use fertilizer in the first oh, place okay yes there are some soils too that are not uh, for instance you need um, um, um nitrogen in a certain quantity to you know help maybe the stem of the crop yes there are some areas that are doing well that goes back to the soil thing i talked about with the ministry however because we are largely reliant on artificial means of replenishing the soil it's not mm. sustainable and it's the same reason why we can't export some of the things we do because the threshold of some of these chemicals are exceeded mm. okay. so we need to and and so organizations like um, like fx mm. in their support of smallholder farmers have parameters those smallholder farmers must meet because they know that they are, they are off takers we need to off take at a certain degree of healthy products okay you, you see so mm. for them they won't have issues that's why they could get into the kind of agreements they are getting into so we need much more off takers doing those kinds of things you know supporting farmers but making sure that things are produced at a certain level of health 
Mm. So that it can easily be exported and even easily be be used because again, you know these things that we are doing to ourselves and we are eating, we don't know the impact yet. Mm. It is like maybe in another fifty hundred years mm. that we will now realize that come we have been accumulating certain chemicals in our body. Even though I know that all those checks are done, but we really cannot tell absolutely mm. yet. So the effects really begin to show. I mean, I could tangent out in several directions. We are having high mortality rates. These are part of it now. We are taking a lot of chemicals we don't know. You don't even know what you are reacting to mm. sometimes because you don't know what you've eaten what you've and eaten. what that thing came with. Mm. So that's at that level. The first question you asked, this is even the second question I was treating. Mm. Um, if I remember accurately what you asked, what the was finance it? Uh, Minister of Agriculture, how My advice, we would have a lot to talk about. Mm. However, I think I would like to start with the sustainable food system. We need to find a, a healthy way. There are ways, but we need to stop paying lip, lip, lip attention to regenerative agriculture and um, to um, soil replenishment, shifting cultivation. So if you farm there for some time, you should leave the land to rest and go okay. and farm elsewhere. That means we need to... Um, the problem with deforestation, which would have meant more land for farming, mm. is that that also affects climate change. So mm. it's, it's a dicey balance, mm. a very dicey balance. You can't also say you want to clear so much land and because those trees are giving us oxygen mm. and it's what is helping also it, it, but, but we have to pay attention to a more sustainable way of doing things okay we need a lot more coordination um, a lot more coordination because we have several people doing several things we need to be able to sit on the same table all right we know that um, cbn is financing there's now the um, the nigerian agricultural development funds we have the ministry of agri mm -hmm. we have a whole lot of agencies in agriculture and it's commendable we can't say we should trim it down because if there is a place that needs funding and attention is agriculture in fact it sometimes shocks me that we rather you know look at our budget national budget and you see how much is being given to ministry of works who are just spending the money and then you see how much is given to um agriculture who are not just spending money they are employing they are providing food they are providing exports mm. and if Ministry of Works is having 800 um, billion, Ministry of Agriculture is having like 400. <laughs> That's part of what we have. And you're, asking, and you're saying infrastructure, and I'm not seeing the infrastructure. Uh, I'm, I'm just seeing um, uh, Engineer Dave Mahi looking at what <laughs> <laughs> I like. <laughs> I'm not seeing the infrastructure. So, so, I mean, we need to also pay that much attention to agriculture. Even though at the minister's level, the budget has already been determined. Mm. But I think there is a need to be brief. Okay in making requests in agriculture so i came from the construction space to agriculture my training ah, okay. is in project management so i started as a construction person and i built several houses all right and then moved into agriculture the kind of courage that construction people have when they are doing boqs that's bill of quantities mm. it's amazing so a kilometer of route you think that one person will die you include that they'll pay compensation one mm. million naira and the person financing it doesn't have a problem with it. But everything in agriculture is scrutinized. And I'm wondering, <laughs> I, I don't understand. And so, so quite literally, you, you can understand the, the apprehension or you can understand the holding back mm. when an agricultural person is asking for money. Mm. So I had a team meeting with my team. So we have the farm monitor product that uses technology. So all of these things that I've said. So what we've done in farm monitor is that we have, um, we use, I'm sure you know what AI is. Great. So you know what machine learning is. Mm. So because there are so many variant indices, soil, climate, good agricultural practice. And even within, when you talk about climate, there are several parameters. When you talk about soil, there are several parameters and all of that. So we integrate this um, 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 using machine learning okay. to make farm specific recommendations to a farm. Okay. So we're having a meeting yesterday and I said, so my, my, my team people came up with, we need to look at our pricing again and all of that. I say, see, see, this is my problem. When it comes to paying for agriculture, everybody wants a price review. Mm. But for every other thing, we are not looking for price review. <laughs> you know, so, and I told them that what, what we have to sell is value. If somebody spends 150000 from mm. 400000 all right? If somebody is spending 150000 from 400000 to buy fertilizer, we, all we need to show them is that, is, that, money. is that with our technology, you will need to spend 150000 on the fertilizer in the first place. Mm. 
Ah, and okay. you only need to pay us 12000 to ensure that. Oh, and when you can <laughs> prove that to the person, the person mm. will gladly pay. Mm. But you need to show the person value. So oh, part okay. of what I'll tell the minister is to look for um, technologists like us and put them in the mainstream. See, things have changed. Mm. We are still living in yesterday. A lot of us, agriculture-wise, we still living in yesterday. Things have really changed. The climate that we depend on to help the food has changed. Mm. The soil, like I told you, has been degraded. Mm. So we can't do... It's not a, a one heart fit all kind of situation again. Okay. We now have to look for ways that, or in specific areas, so that was the conversation I was having in the ministry yesterday, you know, with the soil people. So we now have to find a way that in specific areas, we find what works okay. for that particular area. Because you can also use data from 1960 that we have. Mm. Good things so have now. changed, yeah. All right. Yeah, so those are the kind of things that are encouraging to, to, to look into for sustainability. Mm. Mm. All right, because I hear you talk about AI. So now, if I'm um, looking into the future as mm. 2024, mm. now what things that you as farmers are seeing is different from what we as the end users are seeing. Okay. So what exactly are your projections? What are you seeing when you look at um, 2024 with regards to both um, mechanized farming, with regards to use of AIs, and then at least... How better is it, is, does 2024 look like from where you're sitting or standing at the moment? Okay, so it's, it's a mixed look for me. Mixed because I can be optimistic or, or we can be optimistic all we want. A lot still depends on policies. A mm. lot still depends on government approach. Okay. A, a lot still depends on... Because, you see, government is only next to God. Mm. Uh, and... and, and they can do one thing that can disfavor even what you've done. So, for instance, in the technology space, which is where we have hope that government will begin to adopt. Okay. I was in a policy dialogue um, with um, IFAT's policy dialogue, I think about two weeks ago. The government agencies were pre been presented, represented and all of that. And a lot of conversations went on. And, and somebody in that meeting stood up and said, I am ready to do this tomorrow. Eh? You people that are on the high table that are government. We are finished talking. Can we start this thing now tomorrow? So you now begin to see that the bureaucracy mm. will not even allow it to start. Mm. And you will be thinking that it's this person that will take the decision. When you talk to this person, you tell you it's this person that will take the decision. And ultimately, you realize that we have such a government that it looks to me that it's only the president that can take a decision. <laughs> And uh, well, like we're just very good at policy formulation, but not implementation. Yeah, no, zero implementation. In fact, you got it. You captured it very well. Mm. Zero implementation. So at the end of the day, um, that's why I said it's a mixed feeling for me because I see there's nothing I'm saying here that is new. I'm not the most intelligent agricultural person. There's so. In fact, yesterday when I was in the ministry, I was quite literally awestruck by the kind of depth especially at that um, land's unit had. And I said, we have this kind of thing in Nigeria. Mm. So it is not a question of knowledge. Mm. It has never been a question of know-how. Mm. It has always been a question that, it's like the more you know, in fact, the more the system really gets you to the background. Mm. So that's why I say I'm optimistic because we know. But then I'm now thinking, we will do what we know. <laughs> <laughs> so you see why I'm now saying, yes, I can look at 2024 with optimism. Mm. Because there is so much coming in. Mm. There's so much technology coming in. There's so much knowledge coming in. There's so much, hopefully, funding coming in. But will we actually execute right? Oh, wow. A situation where somebody says, I have 15,000 farmers on my database. So give me input for 15,000 farmers. And then you go to do a farm audit like we're going to, to do, and they have 4,000. Mm. That's the execution we are talking about. All right. So quite literally, 11,000 farmers are not... Can you imagine that? Ah. All right. So we need to execute right. Mm. We need to execute right. And we need to execute around data, which is something we don't have. Ah, data. And then we come back to this matter of data again. <laughs> All right. So now, before we let you go, our time is fast spent because I hear you talk about how um, if you're talking, if you're given um, quantity or uh, if you're given a price to uh, a, a construction engineer, mm. it's quite different from it's a different kettle of fish mm. to what you ha where you have an agriculture mm. or a farmer. Mm. Now, 
is would you actually say that i'm um, going into agricultural sector farming either um uh, animal laws, uh, uh, rearing or mm. farming or agriculture mm. generally. Uh, generally would you actually say is that is this still a lucrative business for someone to go into in 2024 and beyond again it's a mixed it's a mixed reaction to it yes and no no primarily because of insecurity mm. policies um, um adoption executions no but yes because it is still a very viable business all right if you get your indices right mm. you get the right team doing the right things you can also still be profitable but like every other business this is my disclaimer like every other business that takes one two three years to begin to break even you also have to give agriculture the same one two three years i mean you can't jump into the farm and think you are going to start making profit mm -hmm. which is the main you know because we we like quick quick things in nigeria which is the mindset <laughs> everybody that is going yeah which is the mindset of most people going to agriculture yeah, even when you do agriculture with the same mindset so it's not like i'm not i'm not less guilty all right but we, we've got to just like you would and, and see it is the same attitude everywhere hmm. just like you would go and you know do a business and buy and sell you're not going to start making profits immediately hmm. You know, you want to go and trade forex. Somebody just thinks that we will you will put money in there. It's not. It has nothing works like that. All right. Everything takes time mm. for you to make your mistakes, for you to make your corrections. No matter how knowledgeable you are, once you are playing the main game, you are in the business and you are spending money. Even your emotional attachment to your money will make you make mistakes. Mm. You understand? So you have to allow yourself the the right to say okay we did this went to this and then we are now profitable so all agriculture right. is exactly the same way right. we cannot expect a quick it is not a get get rich quick scheme no it has never been but mm. we have people going to ah it's rice because it's fifty thousand in the market mm. now, so is, uh, let's go to, uh, so we, uh, uh, commodity trading and all and then you now go and end up i uh, get your fingers uh, get your fingers burned. so it's all not right. if, if it was that lucrative then everybody that have, i mean look at me now would have been well done <laughs> <laughs> don't use yourself as an example <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel Udeme Joseph, CEO of Farm Monitor Africa. It's yeah. been a wonderful time having this conversation. Thank with you. Me. Thank you so much. And, and I hope we can actually have this conversation again and again. Please, let's do. Thank you. All right, then, viewers. That's all we can take for today. We have been chatting with um, Daniel Udeme Joseph, who is CEO of um, Farm Monitor Africa. And it's been a wonderful time here on D Conversation. I'm sure you must agree. And I'm sure that you've been right me educated entertained and informed i will see you next time keep watching the conversation because you never know who my next guest will be or what i will be speaking of next until i come your way again from the nation's capital abuja i am annabelle oji god bless you and yours god bless nigeria <laughs>